In residential construction, roofs are often thought of as gravity-driven systems that are designed to carry dead, live and snow loads. However, in many high wind events, the most critical force acting on a roof is not downward, but upward. As wind flows over a roof surface, it creates regions of net negative pressure that can lift rafters away from the supporting walls therefore turning a conventional gravity bearing system into an uplift connection controlled design challenge. The International Residential Code addresses wind uplift by embedding uplift resistance into prescriptive connection requirements without requiring explicit pressure calculations. This approach reflects the philosophy of conventional construction which simplifies design by standardizing details that have been shown to perform adequately within defined limits. When those limits are observed, complex analysis is unnecessary. On the other hand, if the limits are exceeded, the code provides clear pathways to stronger, load-rated connections. Understanding where those limits lie and how the code transitions from simple nailing to engineered connectors is essential for anyone designing, detailing or reviewing residential roof framing. Misunderstanding this transition often leads to either unconservative detailing or unnecessary overdesign, both of which can be avoided with a clear reading of the code. This video will look at the mechanics of wind uplift on residential roofs, establishing why uplift forces develop and how they travel through the roof framing system. Additionally, we will examine the prescriptive rafter to wall connections and highlight their implicit uplift capacity, practical limitations and the directions provided when prescriptive nailing is not sufficient. Wind uplift is a pressure-driven phenomenon. To understand how uplift forces develop on a residential roof, it is helpful to begin with calm conditions and then examine how wind alters both external and internal pressures acting on the building. Under calm conditions, with no significant wind acting on the structure, a residential building exists in equilibrium with its surroundings. The air inside the building and the air outside the building are both at approximately ambient atmospheric pressure. This pressure acts uniformly in all directions on every surface. Because atmospheric pressure acts on both sides of the roof assembly, it produces no net force on the roof framing. The pressure pushing upward on the underside of the roof is balanced by the pressure pushing downward on the top surface which means that there is no uplift demand on the roof to wall connections. In this state, the roof system is governed entirely by gravity loads such as dead and live loads or snow loads where applicable. When wind begins to blow, the pressure environment around the building changes. The oncoming wind first stagnates against the windward wall, producing positive pressure. A portion of this flow is deflected upward and accelerates over the roof as it follows the sloping surface. According to Bernoulli's principle, this increased velocity yields lower external pressures on the roof compared to ambient atmospheric conditions. As the wind accelerates over the windward slope and crosses the ridge, the flow separates from the roof surface due to the abrupt change in direction, forming a turbulent wake region with vortices and recirculating eddies. This separation prevents the airflow from reattaching fully to the leeward slope, creating a zone of persistently low pressure or suction. Therefore, even without considering what is happening inside the building, we can already see that external wind activity is causing uplift demands on the roof framing. In addition to what is happening outside the building, the interior space also responds to the changing pressure field outside. Internal pressure in a building plays a significant role in the net wind uplift forces on a roof, acting in combination with the external suction generated by wind flow. In wind design, Residential buildings are typically classified as enclosed structures. However, this does not mean that they are airtight. Unintentional leakage paths, intentional openings such as vents and flues and even operable doors and windows allow limited airflow which causes the internal pressure to shift slightly above or below ambient atmospheric pressure in response to the exterior wind field. When air enters the building through openings on the windward side, an increase in internal pressure pushes the roof outwards from below which amplifies the uplift forces when combined with external suction. This is the most critical wind uplift condition. On the other hand, 
When dominant openings are located on the leeward side, a reduction in internal pressure may occur as air is sucked out of the building into the low-pressure exterior leeward side. Although the external roof surface still experiences suction pulling outward, the lower internal pressure means the outward push from inside is diminished, leading to a reduced net uplift compared to the positive internal pressure case. These pressure demands are transferred through the roof sheathing to rafters or trusses and ultimately as uplift forces to the supporting walls. As wind speed increases, the resulting uplift forces can increase rapidly, often reaching levels where the capacity of simple prescriptive connections is exceeded. For this reason, wind uplift design in residential construction is fundamentally a connection problem governed by the ability of the roof to wall connections to resist forces safely and continuously throughout the load path. The International Residential Code provides the requirements for uplift resistance at the roof to wall connections in Section R802.11. The section applies to conventional roof framing and trusses and is primarily concerned with the adequacy of connections and not the strength of the roof members themselves. The purpose is to ensure that wind-induced uplift forces developed at the roof level are safely transferred into the supporting walls. Table R802.11 is a prescriptive table that provides wind uplift demands at the truss or rafter to wall connections. Uplift demands presented on this table are based on wind speed, wind exposure, roof pitch, member spacing and roof span. This table recognizes that designers following prescriptive design provisions in the International Residential Code need to consider specific wind uplift forces within the framework of conventional design which does not require engineering calculations. This means that the alternative to using this table is to have a licensed engineer or architect determine wind uplift forces through engineering analysis that includes the determination of net pressures due to wind. This table may be used with projects involving rafters or trusses. While rafters may be designed based on the prescriptive provisions of the International Residential Code, trusses must be engineered as noted in Section R802.10.2. Additionally, Item 6 in Section R802.10.1 specifies that truss design drawings should include information on the reaction force and direction at each support. Therefore, for conventional residential design projects using trusses, the designer should use the uplift reaction provided in the truss calculations when sizing the truss to wall connections that are intended to resist uplift loads. If you would like to learn about the integration of manufactured trusses in conventional framing, then please check out the Residential Wood Framing Design Series at www.conventionalframing.com. The integration of trusses in conventional framing design is covered in the first module on conventional roof framing design where we show how a designer can use the uplift loads provided in the truss calculations to size connectors with sufficient capacity to resist uplift demands. Additionally, we show how designers can review all aspects of engineered trusses to ensure conformance with the overall design intent and code requirements. A designer integrating manufactured roof trusses should be able to examine truss drawings and verify that all aspects conform to the overall design intent and ensure that the supporting structure is sufficiently designed to provide load path for all reactions including wind uplift loads. Please check out the first module on roof framing at www.conventionalframing.com. Let us look at an example that helps us understand how Table R802.11 is applied in design. Consider a one-story enclosed residential building with a gable roof framed using conventional rafters. The roof has a horizontal span of 36 feet, the roof pitch is 4 to 12 and rafters are spaced at 24 inches on center. The building is located in a region with a basic wind speed of 110 miles per hour and is in a suburban region classified as wind exposure B. No unusual topographic or enclosure conditions are assumed and the building qualifies for prescriptive construction under the International Residential Code. Table R802.11 is broadly grouped based on the wind exposure. Therefore, we will focus on the exposure B section. The next broad group is the rafter spacing. 
Since our rafters are spaced at 24 inches on center, we will focus on the 24-inch spacing row. For projects where the wind speed is 110 miles per hour and where the roof pitch is 4 to 12, which is less than 5 to 12, and for a roof span of 36 feet, the uplift demand at the rafter to wall support is 188 pounds. This is the net uplift force. According to footnote B at the same table, this uplift force already includes an allowance for a roof ceiling assembly dead load of 15 pounds per square foot. This means that the roof and ceiling assembly dead loads have already been subtracted to arrive at this load. The next step is to determine how the 188 pound uplift force can be resisted. According to the exception in section R802.11, rafters and trusses shall be permitted to be attached to their supporting wall assemblies in accordance with Table 1 of Section R602.3. Table 1 of Section R602.3 is also known as the fastening schedule. Item 6 provides four toenail options for the attachment of rafters to the top plates. The nailing options include either 316 penny box nails or 310 penny common nails or 410 penny box nails or 4 3 inch by 0.131 inch diameter nails. For each of these options, the nails are required to be toenailed from the rafters or trusses to the top plates. The question at this point is whether these conventional nailing options have sufficient capacity to resist the 188 pound uplift force demand at the end of the rafters. The exception in section R802.11 permits the use of conventional nailing to meet the uplift demands in table R802.11 where at least one of the two listed conditions is met. Both conditions are not required to apply simultaneously. The first condition states that conventional nailing is permitted to resist wind uplift demands at the roof where the specific gravity of the wall framing lumber is 0.42 or greater and the uplift force at an individual rafter or truss bearing location does not exceed 200 pounds. This first condition is capacity based and depends on both the uplift demand and the material properties of the wall framing. The uplift force is determined directly from table R802.11 and we have shown that the uplift demand on our project is 188 pounds which is less than the 200 pound limit. This means we are good as far as the load is concerned but still need to check the specific gravity. The specific gravities of lumber are listed in the American Wood Council's National Design Specification. Common lumber species used in framing residential structures including Douglas fir, hem fir, southern pine and spruce pine fir have specific gravities equal to or exceeding 0.42. Therefore, if our project is using any of these species, then we have met all the requirements and we do not need to check the second condition or provide additional uplift connections. When both the material threshold and the 200 pound uplift limit are satisfied, the code deems conventional nailing sufficient without the need for additional uplift hardware. The second condition is configuration based and does not require explicit reference to an uplift force value. Under this provision, prescriptive attachment is permitted to meet all uplift demand where the basic wind speed does not exceed 115 miles per hour. The building is located in exposure category B. The roof pitch is 5 to 12 or steeper the roof span is 32 feet or less, and the rafters or trusses are spaced no more than 24 inches on center. When all of these geometric and environmental limits are met, the IRC presumes that uplift forces remain within the capacity of prescriptive nailing, regardless of wood species-specific gravity. These two conditions operate as alternative compliance paths, not cumulative requirements. If neither condition is met, either because uplift forces exceed 200 pounds, or the wood species has lower specific gravity, or the building falls outside the configuration limits, then prescriptive nailing is no longer permitted, and roof-to-wall connections must be designed using approved uplift connectors. As we have observed, the prescriptive provisions of section R802.11 are intentionally bounded. When either the uplift force per rafter exceeds the limits of the exception or the building configuration falls outside the prescribed envelope, the code requires a transition from prescriptive attachment to engineered roof-to-wall connections. 
the designer must ensure that the required uplift force is resisted through listed connectors or engineered connections and that a continuous load path is maintained from the roof framing into the supporting wall system. Consider for example a case in which table R802.11 indicates an uplift demand of 500 pounds per rafter, with a roof pitch that is less than 5 to 12. In this situation, the exception in section R802.11 that permits reliance on prescriptive roof-to-wall attachment is no longer applicable, and conventional nailing alone cannot be relied upon to resist the required uplift force. This does not mean that the prescriptive roof-to-wall attachment becomes irrelevant. The conventional toe nailing specified in the fastening schedule may still be provided as part of the connection, but it cannot be relied upon as the sole means of uplift resistance. An additional rafter-to-wall connector must therefore be specified with sufficient capacity such that the overall roof-to-wall connection is capable of resisting the full 500-pound uplift demand. In practice, engineers often consider the prescriptive attachment as contributing to the overall connection behavior, with the supplemental connector selected to ensure that the combined system provides adequate uplift resistance. The International Residential Code does not mandate a specific connector or fastener type when loads exceed 200 pounds. For such cases, there are many possible design options available to an engineer, but we will look at two options. The first option includes providing fasteners such as screws with higher withdrawal capacities than nails. The capacity of the connection must be determined through engineering analysis. The second option, which is the most common option is to use proprietary pre-engineered connectors with valid code evaluation reports showing that they have been evaluated for code compliance. However, the selected connector must be installed in accordance with its code evaluation report and manufacturer instruction. Additionally, and importantly, the selected connector must have sufficient capacity to resist the uplift forces. If you would like to learn about the selection of approved listed connectors to resist wind uplift forces on roof rafters, please check out the roof framing module at www.conventionalframing.com. The design project included in this module shows you how to determine the uplift forces and specify hurricane ties with sufficient capacity to resist the uplift demands. Additionally, we show you how to specify this information in construction drawings as required for permit issuance and construction. If you found this video helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more insights into wood framing.